Welcome back to the third terahertz photonics open course. And uh, this afternoon, it's our great honor to have Professor Ranjian and to give us a, a tutorial about terahertz silicon topological photonics for sixth generation communications and beyond. Before Professor Ranjian start his uh, tutorial, I'd like first to give a short introduction about him. So Ranja is an associate professor at NTU Singapore. He received, the, uh, he received a PhD in photonics from Oklahoma State University in 2009. He then joined Los Alamos National Laboratory in 2013. He founded the TerraX Labs at the Center for Dis Disruptive Photonics, Photonic Technologies uh, at NTU. He is an OSA fellow for pioneering contributions to terahertz science and technology. His research interest includes terahertz for the sixth generation communications, metal surfaces, and the light induced high TC superconductivity. He has raised uh, more than 12 million US dollars in competitive research grants. Since 2020, he has been listed as the top 1% highly cited research. Okay, that's a very impressive introduction. So let's warmly welcome Professor Ranjan to give us the talk. Thank you so much, Xiaojun, for such, a, such an elaborate and kind introduction. I would like to first of all thank you and other organizers for organizing such a wonderful series of talks under the umbrella of photonic open courses. I think such uh, elaborate talks with discussions are very important, especially for young students um, to be inspired by what is the cutting edge research that's going on, especially in the terahertz arena, uh, by getting some top researchers of the field and students getting a first-hand uh, opportunity to interact with them. And, and I feel very honored uh, to be among all of you today. And thank you so much for having me. So I would like to share some of the effort that's going on um, globally and also in my group um, in an attempt to push towards 60 communications and we are focused mainly on doing terahertz devices that may come handy for 60 communication. As you see here in, in this uh, picture, that uh, basically um, the, the broad scheme was proposed by Nokia Bell Labs. And, and I have Singapore here because I'm developing 6G at SG, SG Singapore. Now, the entire concept of 6G as to what new um, use cases and what new disruptive um, technologies that it's bringing in uh, has to do with uh, intelligence and connecting biology with the physical and the digital world. So the massive deployment of sensors in the 5G era has already connected the physical and the digital world the connection of the physical and the digital world with the biological world is still missing. And this is what is going to um, happen with the onset of 6G communication. For example, it is being believed that we humans will have a clone, a digital clone that can represent us, for example, um, in, in physical meetings and there would be a network with a sixth sense. So, so 6G network with a sixth sense where our phone in conjunction with the network will be able to advise us as to what we should do. For example, if you want to go and have lunch somewhere, it can give you an optimum information as to where you should go and what type of food you like. So overall, the concept is that 6G communication is going to augment human in a way that our productivity will get enhanced substantially. Um, 
So one of the tips that we did um, about three years back, it's a silicon chip with some topological feature embedded on it. And our first generation uh, demonstration showed that we could send data at speed of, speed of 11 gigabits per second on the silicon chip, which is basically a topological waveguide. Now somebody, um, this, um, yeah, took this finding and made a YouTube video that's titled "6G Explained" and a picture there. And and I was surprised to see that a few days back, this video has about 7.6 million views. So I would say that there's tremendous interest in general for the for the disruption that 6G can bring. Now, this is what accomplished about two years back. Our most recent devices uh, we've demonstrated could go up to speeds of 160 gigabits per second. And we are moving towards enhancing the bandwidth of our topological wave guys so that we could get to up to half a terabit per second of speed. Our, our eventual goal is to be able to transmit a terabit for second data on a silicon chip. And uh, at this point, we don't know how, how we'll get there, but we are very close to demonstrating half a terabit per second of data transmission over two centimeter distance on a silicon chip. Now, when you think about wireless communication, um, you have to first manage signal on the chip so that your losses are extremely small, and then your over-the-air efficiencies could also be enhanced. So with this uh, background or the motivation, let me first uh, acknowledge all, all my students and postdocs who, who toil very hard in the lab, and most of the results that I will present uh, are generated by them. So EHAV is the postdoc who did the, the 2020 chip design. And right now, a lot of chip design is being done by Abhishek and Thomas and Manoj. So basically, this is the core group of uh, student and postdocs who are working on this technology. And I have my very precious collaborators who helped us do the first generation device and are also helping us right now to build our 6G test bed here in, in Singapore with the support of uh, National Research Foundation Singapore that has generously also funded a project on a topological silicon photonics for 6G communication. Um, now, uh, this is something that Nokia Bell Labs published that 6G will be standing on these six pillars. And there's a lot of activity in this direction um, with, with all sorts of technologies coming in together, all the way from AI, ML, new spectrum technologies. This is where Trahat sits, and this is what I and my group are doing. But then there's also a lot of work going on in using terahertz radiation as a sensor because terahertz radiation will be all over as a wireless network in, in 60 communications. People are also looking into new architectures um, to enhance the, the speed of computation that can happen in real time on cloud. Um, so in terms of extreme seamless connectivity, there's a, there's a lot of um, uh, software, uh, software type of work going on, and all of this development that that going that's going to happen should happen with a high level of security and trust. So, with a lot of data flowing over the network, you want to make sure that the network is is well protected and has high enough security. Um, so, oh, what happened? Yeah, so. So basically, the, the disruptive applications that we are looking at uh, in terms of uh, terahertz network itself, um, so you may know that optical fiber can send data at speeds of 
hundreds of terabit per second. Um, now, the roadblock is how could we wirelessly also um, transmit data over the air at the speeds at terabit per second speeds. Um, so optical fiber, the frequency is much higher, it's the telecom wavelength. So their bandwidth is like 1,000 or 10,000 times more than the RF bandwidth, but that's not true for, for the wireless. So one natural extension beyond 5G frequencies is, is the use of above 100 gigahertz waves. And that's where the terahertz uh, comes in. So with terahertz radiation, it would be possible to have, for example, short range link that can send data at terabit per second, for example, at terahertz Wi-Fi. Now, the short terahertz link could also come very handy in wireless data centers where you could get rid of actual wires flying all around. You could have a TDPS wireless link. Um, now, uh, wires are linked from one point to another point, but the, the wireless could be configured in many different ways where you could have multiple combination of, of links and, and could be managed uh, much more efficiently and precisely, uh, leading to uh, to a tremendous cost saving in terms of in terms of energy and um, high bandwidth terahertz will also be very useful for ultra high definition videos. For example, for super immersive telepresence, um, like how we are talking right now or discussing right now through an electronic um hosting of uh, of a course um now uh, it's also being thought that autonomous vehicles um will use terahertz radiation for a better resolution of the images so there's this whole idea of convergence of radar and communications so right now automobile Radar a sits at around 77 gigahertz, but that will have its limitations in terms of what you can resolve um, uh, sitting sitting inside the car, uh, how much you could resolve the images. But if you could go for higher frequency and shorter wavelengths, then your resolution could be higher. And that's where terahertz could, could come handy. So terahertz radar, along with communications uh, will, will eventually be converged in the 6G era. And um, I just want to share with you that there are many, many companies uh, who are interested in, in this space. There'll be millions of jobs that will get generated as a result of this technology and the multiple uh, aspects of these technologies, starting from software to hardware to network architecture to, to many other things. Um, so therefore, we believe that this is also uh, 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 an era that will give huge impetus to, to global economy. Uh, and just beyond 5G and 6G market is supposed to be a $13 trillion um, economy which was uh, which was uh, published by Qualcomm. Um, now, when we talk about communication, we are talking about uh, managing data on the chip and other is over the air, which is the free space communication. So um, terahertz can come to rescue in both cases, um, of course, with its own advantages and disadvantages, Example right now, uh, um, typically a metallic copper wire is used as an interconnect between CPU and memory, and there's tremendous dual loss along this interconnect that happens. For example, if we could change this uh, from a metallic wire to a silicon wave type, there wouldn't be any dual losses and there wouldn't be any bandwidth limitation all the way up till the up till the band gap of the silicon so you can get extremely large bandwidth by using a, a silicon interconnect 
um, on chip between two different components um, for high data bit rate transmission. Um, now, the other, um, the other application is the medium range communication where we are trying to communicate over distances of tens of centimeter to about tens of meters. Um, so because the terahertz source is, is still a big, uh, uh, a big uh, open problem, high power source, especially a source that could be um, that could be generated electronically uh, is, is still a limitation. Therefore, that limits this this range. Um, but up to I think up to about hundred meters, uh, terahertz should still be handy uh, for the obvious advantage of the bandwidth that we get. Uh, now. Uh, coming back to the some figure of merit discussion for on on chip um, enhancement of efficiencies, so what you see on the y-axis is basically um, a product of bandwidth density and energy efficiency. So by bandwidth density, uh, what I mean is how much of data you could pack per millimeter square of area. And energy efficiency is how much energy would you spend to send one bit? Uh, and when you take a, a product of this, it, it comes up with, uh, with a certain figure of merit. Now, these metallic type of interconnects, as the length goes up, so for example, this is about one millimeter, this is about 10 centimeter length scale, and you go from one millimeter to up to 10 centimeter, um, you can see that this interconnect, the efficiency of the interconnect drops by two to three orders of magnitude. Now, can we do something to overcome these losses? And one solution could be that we replace this with silicon. And that's where a silicon waveguide uh, could be useful. Here again, I show a, a chip architecture where the interconnect itself could be a dielectric interconnect, for example, silicon. And we did some, um, some calculations. And as you see in this table, uh, silicon is being able to, to send um, much higher speed data uh, compared, to the, compared to the copper. Right, and there's no new loss with a silicon waveguide. So here's where um, here's where uh, an idea of a low loss silicon interconnect becomes very important, uh, which I will be talking about in, in just in some time. Here in this figure, what I'm showing you is an evolution of every generation of communication. As you could see on the x-axis, that almost every 10 years, we have a new generation for wireless communication. So right now, we are sitting somewhere here where we are witnessing the onset of 5G communication. Uh, 10 years from now, or about nine years from now, we'll be somewhere here in the 6G era, which R&D is, 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 is going in a very intense way all around the world. Now, the two numbers that you would see changing with every generation is the peak data rate uh, at which wireless communication becomes possible and the frequency of the carrier waves. Now for 5G, the frequency of the carrier wave that's going to be used or is being used is way below 100 gigahertz. Um, and the peak data rate that you can get uh, is about 10 gigabits per second. But when we go to 6G, the carrier frequency will hopefully go above 100 gigahertz and the peak data rate will be from 100 gigabits per second to up to a terabit per second. Uh, now, you may know that X becomes extremely lossy as you go above 100 gigahertz frequency. So up to 100 gigahertz microwaves, traditional microwaves or conventional microwaves are fine. 
But above 100 gigahertz, you start to see a, a lot of challenges in your devices where your power amplifiers are, are no longer as efficient. The, the power of the signal that you generate electronically is not so high. And therefore, some ideas from photonics could be helpful. Um, and and her sits right between electronics and photonics, sharing the advantages of, of both communities and the disadvantages of both communities, right? So here I'm trying to convince you that some revolutionary photonic ideas may help electronics to reduce losses on chip, okay? And one of the technologies would be um, the idea of, of uh, topological insulators itself. Now, um, here what I'm trying to tell you is that for all the uh, computation that's going to happen on cloud, uh, we need big bytes of data to be transported in real time, and therefore Terra's carrier will be useful. And you can see that almost all spheres of our life will be affected by the applications that get supported not just by the cloud, but also on the edge of the cloud. Okay. Uh, so here, uh, in this picture, uh, what I'm trying to show you is the attenuation uh, with respect to the frequency. So you can see that there are specific bands where the attenuation is extremely large. And now there are certain regions and I and I particularly, we are working on, on, on in this region, 200 to 300 gigahertz or near about 300 gigahertz because the attenuation is lower than 10 dB per kilometer. As you ramp up the frequency, you see that the attenuation also goes up, but we need to, identify these channels of low attenuation and work around this, design our devices around this, uh, around these band of frequencies. Um, here, what you see is the bandwidth that is required to hit higher speeds of, of data communication, um, ranging from 100 gigabits per second to up to one terabit per second. So these are the numbers that will be the target numbers for 6G communication. And you can see that as your data rate has to go up, either you compromise on the bandwidth. So if you, if you want to shrink the bandwidth, then you go with a more complex modulation. For example, with about 200 gigahertz bandwidth and using 64 QAM, which is quadrature amplitude modulation, it's a uh, complex modulation technique uh, will allow you to hit this magical number of, of one terabit per second. If you want to go for a simple modulation scheme, then the bandwidth required is extremely large. Uh, so this shows a trade-off between the available bandwidth and the types of modulation schemes that you could use uh, to get the desired data rate. And the communication distance, um, these are some ideal numbers. Uh, I don't think this has been demonstrated experimentally, but um, these are these are encouraging numbers that between 200 and 300 gigahertz band, you could you could get up to two kilometer of communication distance. Um, but even if we could get uh, 100 meters or more than 100 meters. I would say it's still a, a very useful or a handy technology. Now in the carrier aggregation picture, this is where the terahertz band sits. 5G is about um, millimeter waves. 6G will be, 6G and beyond will be about submillimeter waves, uh, the terahertz waves. So you can see that the, that the reach that you have for each particular frequency or wavelength is shorter and shorter as you go from longer wavelength to shorter wavelength and terahertz being the shortest in the RF spectrum, right? So the reach of terahertz will not be so much 
and terahertz will not be the only technology. It can it can be a complementing technology to all the other generations, uh, but it's it's very advantageous when it comes to ultra high throughput, which is mainly because of the large bandwidth. Here again in the carrier aggregation picture, you see that these ellipses represent the overall reach of, of every generation and for terahertz, the ellipse is the smallest. So the range will be a problem, uh, but what it provides is, is a big pipe of data through which you can funnel a, a lot of data and take help of the longer wavelengths to, to carry the information to, to further distances. Uh, so, so here, once again, what I'm trying to compare is uh, the state of the art of wireless and the wired, um, the wired form of communication. So you can see that um, um, internet cables still support um, about tens of gigabits per second of data transfer and wireless is lower than ethernet cables. But if wireless has to compete with these wired cables, then it has to um, uh, resort to higher bandwidth, uh, higher bandwidth signal, and terahertz is a is a good proposition for that. So here it could the wireless could meet the wired uh, performance, and and therefore we need new technologies um, based on some new concepts. And one of the new concepts is that of a topological insulator. I'll talk more about what exactly topological insulators are, but here from the band diagram, you could see that basically the conduction and the valence bands are separated by a large uh, energy. And the sharp lines that you see are basically conducting states. And this is, this is these are the electronic conducting states states the and the arrows show that these are spin locked spin and momentum locked um, uh, conducting particles uh, that give you the the quantum behavior or the uh, conductance only at surface and insulation in the bulb so this whole idea of topological insulator from electronics or or for fermions is translated into uh, into managing photons or transporting photons. For example, transport photons through this waveguide that has many sharp bands. Now, one remarkable feature of these topological insulators is, is that on the surface, even if it sees some defect, this electron can just go around that defect and continue to propagate in its um, in in its in its direction, whether it's forward or backward, it doesn't get perturbed by defects. Um, and what's the counterpart of defect in photonic systems? So, so the sharp bands are the counterpart of of defects in fermionic systems. You can see that light could be guided very efficiently along the sharp bands if we design a chip, uh, this, what you see in the background is a silicon chip with a topological embedded feature that would mimic this fermionic feature that you see here, okay? And you could achieve unidirectional propagation and the propagation or the transport of photons is immune to sharp bending. So one of our near, uh, uh, near future target is to be able to uh, to get data communication over 10 meter distance at 50 gigabits per second, just using a, a silicon transmitter and a silicon uh, receiver. So uh, now getting, uh, getting a little bit more into the basics of what exactly topological insulators are, specifically for students who are new to this concept, what you see here is uh, an electron that uh, moves or that moves like a superfluid, but it moves only along the edges. It doesn't, this is a 
Imagine that this is a 2D system where the electron move only on the edges. Uh, the bulk is not conducting, the bulk is insulating. And the way these electron conducts is almost like a superfluid and it doesn't get scattered by any defect that it sees on its path. It doesn't get scattered by any defect and it doesn't scatter into the bulk, okay? So, so that's the beauty of these uh, fermionic topological insulators. And, and this happened uh, over a period of time where uh, some of these uh, pioneering authors um, contributed to this discovery. And now all of these nice concepts are being, um, uh, being uh, tested in photonics, in acoustics and, and, and other fields. Uh, so just to start, if you consider a, a 2D system, a 2D insulating system, like as you see here in the band diagram and cool that system down and apply a high magnetic field, you will see a, a quantized state opening up. This entire process uh, is known as a quorum hall effect uh, discovered by Von Klitzing in 1980, for which he got a Nobel Prize. Um, now, the, the limitation of the system is that you have to go down to low temperature and apply extremely high magnetic fields. Uh, now, you see that uh, there's transport that happens on the top edge and in the bottom edge, uh, but the electrons that are there in the bulk, they do not, they do not move. So what this line tells is that there is something, there's a particle that's moving with a finite group velocity, and that's the transport of the electrons. So either if the slope is positive, then the movement is in the forward direction. If the slope is negative, then the movement is in the backward direction. But all the physics of uh, 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 a topological system lies here in this line where it says that the, the state itself is far from the bulk. So any defect or any perturbation that tries to curb the transport of, of this particular particle and an electron uh, is not successful in deviating it from its path until unless that defects can connect the two bands, the two bulk bands. So it, it, it's a pretty cool system that way. So everything that happens here at low temperature and high magnetic field happens in a modern topological insulator, but without a magnetic field, without an external magnetic field, you get this um, quantum-like state. And in spite of the absence of magnetic field, it happens because of a strong spin orbit coupling. A strong, in orbit, uh, strong spin orbit coupling leads to band inversion and, um, and opening up of this quantum state. So, so that way, this is a, a remarkable system. And the system comes with all these advantages of no backscattering, uh, no scattering into the bulk, there's no external magnetic field required, and it happens because of a uh, strong spin orbit interaction. Now, uh, photonic systems are different. Um, they don't respond. Uh, typically, they don't respond to external magnetic fields. So people had to figure out ways of inducing um, this topological effect with photons, and, and they came up with some brilliant ideas where one of the approaches uh, was to break the inversion spatial symmetry of the system. So it's basically, you could think about, think of it as breaking the geometrical symmetry in a way that, that it would induce a, a topological phase transition. So there, has, there were some early papers in the topological photonics community that, that showed that even though your, your photonic system doesn't respond to external magnetic field, um, 
just by breaking or the symmetry of the of the system, you could induce a topological feature in your device. Um, and one of the approaches is this in the inversion symmetry breaking. And typically, these systems are are called valley hall um, photonic systems because the propagation of photon is valley locked. And I would show you that uh, the the K and the K dash valleys they uh, they host a, a, a Berry phase, which is uh, synonymous with uh, evidence that the system itself is is uh, topological. Now, what you see here in this uh, picture is a, a silicon wafer with punched holes. The these triangles are the punched holes. So you have a, a large triangle and a small triangle and you make a hexagonal lattice out of this. So you see that the large triangle and a small triangle, their structural sizes are different. So that is the structural symmetry breaking that is done. Imagine that they are structurally symmetric. So if the two triangles were identical, then in the omega k dispersion or the, in the band diagram, they show that, um, that there's a Dirac point at the K valley and the K dash valley. So this is the Dirac-like behavior. You can see the crossing um, here. And, and this is for a, a perfectly C6 symmetric structure where, the, uh, where there's no asymmetry. But when you break the symmetry of the system, for example, here, this, um, this Dirac point, uh, the uh, the Dirac point goes away, you open a band gap, and this band gap is what is what that is, is the feature that determines the bandwidth of the device itself. Now, opening up of this band gap uh, is is an is very important, and how much it opens up to what spectral uh, extent is also important because that determines the, the bandwidth of the device itself. And that is limited by the refractive index contrast between air and the material that you're using. So these triangles are, um, these are etched holes in a silicon membrane. And this silicon wafer is about 200 micron thin. Okay. So once you have lifted the degeneracy, opening up the gap, you could bring two opposite, two opposite or two mirror symmetric systems together. For example, here to form a domain wall. So here you can see that on the top, on the top side, your big triangle is inverted, but on the bottom side, your big triangle is erect, right? So they have mirror symmetry. Now, when you make a domain, uh, a kink state appears. So this opposite mirror symmetry um, sort of gives uh, rise to a topological phase transition that allows the transport of photons only at this edge. Um, what you see here at the K and the K dash point is the Berry curvature you can see that the phase is exactly opposite. And this is uh, known as the, 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 the phase at the valley, uh, at, at the K and the K dash valley, and is the synonymous of the, the topological invariance that exists in the system. So uh, now, now in terms of the state itself, what kind of state uh, comes into existence? when you form this domain wall uh, where a topological phase transition happens. So this is the gap that opened up that I was talking, the Dirac gap that opens up. And, and then you have this linear type of state. So depending on what kind of interface you make, if this uh, configuration of unit cell is type A and the inverted one is type B, then you can form an AB type of interface. An AB type of interface will give you this particular feature, okay? Which is, is 
quite linear. I mean, it has a, um, a, a linear dispersion and it is this dispersion that dictates um, uh, somehow the seamless flow of photons within the waveguide. If you make a BA type of interface, then you get this uh, this type of dispersion. Okay, here also um, you can see that the the, the blue the blue uh, dispersion and the black dispersion they are orthogonal. So if black dispersion represents a valley lock propagation forward propagation um, lock to K valley, then the the blue line represents a valley lock propagation in the backward direction, okay? Because the slope is a negative. And here for the black line, the slope is positive. So, uh, and that's what we observe. You see that for an AB kind of interface, the photons are moving in the forward direction, whereas for the BA type, the photons move in the opposite direction. So how you would make the interface is something that will determine the direction of flow of your photons. And this gives you a lot of flexibility in engineering your devices, right? Here is uh, one of our, our first devices that we did, uh, where you can see that this is um, the silicon tip um, with about 10 bands. It has 10 sharp bands. And uh, this is the zoom version of the device. In terms of transmission, we see, we see that the transmission through a wave guide and a 10 band uh, topological wave guide is exactly identical. So first what we did, we made a straight gain wall here, and then we twisted the gain wall in this form. And you can see that the difference between the straight and the 10 band is, um, is minimal, there's no difference. 10 band one is as good as the straight one. There is no topological interface. You see that the propagation is, is, um, is quite quenched or is very, very noisy. Now, when we compare the performance of the topological waveguide with the traditional photonic crystal waveguide, you can see that uh, the loss per bend at each of these bend is extremely small in case of the topological waveguide, but it's quite significant in, in case of traditional photonic crystal waveguide. Now, when this uh, transmission happened, uh, we have a bandwidth of about 25 to 30 gigahertz. We wanted to use this bandwidth for communication type of application. And that's what we did by using a simple on-off scheme, uh, simple on-off modulation, we could get almost 11 gigabits per second of, of data communication at extremely low um, bit error rate. So you can see that beyond 11 gigabits per second, the bit error rate starts to ramp up. Uh, this is the clear eye diagram showing the bits. Um, and here is the here is a setup uh, of our device. And in the background, you see a, a 4K ultra high definition uh, TV. I will show you a video in the next slide about that, and and this is how the the device and the and the setup looks like. So, uh, so let me show you uh, this video of how our our topological waveguide could could act as a device in a wireless network. So. Uh, please note that the source and the detector and everything is outside the chip. The chip is only a waveguide, okay? And it's a geometrically engineered topological waveguide to which we send uncompressed video data that could be seen on the TV in the background. And, and this video data propagates wirelessly in, the, in this region, and we'll try to block this region and, and this video will disappear if you block it with metal, but with paper that doesn't happen. So let me play the video for you. So here is the ultra high definition video in the background. Here is the device. You can see all the different uh, bands. You, you bring in a paper 
and nothing happens because terahertz doesn't get blocked by the paper. And then you bring in a metallic sheet and that blocks um, the video in the background. Now, since you remove that, we have the reappearance of the video. Now, uh, so this concept, basically we want to uh, extend to other devices where we've started to look into designing cavities that would be useful for either a demultiplexer or a modulator or a sensor application. And then the eventual goal is to integrate on-chip sources and detectors with this topological platform um, so that eventually the goal of 6G transceivers, Teras transceivers, uh, supporting data communication at terabit per second would be possible. Now, at this point, I would like to take a pause and let the audience ask questions, um, and and then we can and then we can go to the second part of my talk, where I will show you other devices that we've developed with this topological platform. Okay. So are there some questions in the Zoom meeting? Maybe we ask the audience in the Zoom meeting first. And there is one question from the online platform. Yeah, just to regard to this video you show here, and uh, the audience question is, in the wireless uh, communication radio, how can you confirm that there is no terahertz wave directly propagate into the receiver, but not propagate in a waveguide? Here, this. Understand this question, mm -hmm. Ranjan? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah, so, so that's a very good question. I had another video where when we when we remove this coupler out when we we can gradually remove the device out and we will see that the video disappears and in that case we won't have a wireless channel we just connect the the output end to the video mm -hmm. so there's um yeah i should have i should have played that video so we've we've done other set of experiments to make sure that the video data is actually going through the device. But that's a very good question. <laughs> yeah, maybe I should always show the other video also. Yeah, okay. So the second question is, um, what is the coupling efficiency for your device? Uh, very good, very good question. So our coupling efficiencies are up to 99%. So we, we've designed our couplers. Uh, so, so designing these couplers uh, are, are very, 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 very important and can be tricky. But if you want to have um, good, good bandwidth and good signal through your chip, then you have to spend a lot of time on designing these input and output couplers. Yeah, but okay. but we can get 99% coupling efficiency. Wow, that's very good. And the third question is, uh, okay. Oh, can this waveguide support other frequencies? What is the bandwidth for this waveguide? Yeah, yeah. So that's a great question. Now, um, for now, because we have a topological feature embedded in it, our devices are limited to, uh, so this particular device, the bandwidth is about uh, 25 gigahertz. Um, we've improved the bandwidth of this type of, um, this type of topological design to about 30, 35 gigahertz, which I will show in the next part of my talk. But generally speaking, um, we, we've observed that We've looked at all kinds of geometries and all kinds of designs. And the most latest designs that we have could have bandwidth of up to 120 gigahertz. 
So 120 gigahertz is enough to, to send in above half a terabit per second of data. Um, so so that's that's the that's some of our most recent design results with that we are trying to test with our devices, but we are not yet there. Yeah. Okay. The, the first finish this one. Okay. The first question is <laughs> it's interesting. Why people do not directly use topological insulators to do this work, but have to use this silicon? Uh, terahertz topological waveguide. Uh, yes, so that, that's a good question. Um, so, uh, so basically, topological insulators are, are fermionic systems. So they are great um, to flow uh, electrical currents or electronic currents. And there's a big, big electronic uh, community um, that's working on that, where people are looking at the, the low energy flow of electrons or flow of current through topological insulators, but it has not gotten to a point where um, people will start replacing these metals from uh, CMOS circuitry. I think the research for that is still in its uh, nascent, um, in its early stages. Now, if you want to uh, transmit photons, I mean, transport photons, then you need to come up with a photonic device. So here the, the, the underlying mechanism is actually very close to that of an optical fiber. So total internal reflection is the underlying mechanism that, that is doing the wave guiding. So, so for the same reasons that optical fiber can't be replaced by a copper wire. You need this chip to transport the the the, the terahertz wave. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. There, the last one. The last one is: Are there some other? Yeah. Are there some other uh, functions besides bending the terahertz wave in the waveguide? Are there some other functions? Yeah, what does that yeah, mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so I think I think the the question is that is probably somebody is trying to ask why do you need to bend the terahertz wave? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, and why not send the terahertz wave straight through the waveguide? Now, bending on chip allows denser integration. Um, so, so, so a, a complete chip architecture would require us to use uh, uh, phase shifters, uh, modulators, and other components, which means that we, we will have to um, operate on the terahertz signal that's there on the chip. And if bends are allowed, then that reduces the size of the chip. Mm. Okay, and it allows denser integration of other components on the chip. Yeah, there's no more question for this part. Okay, no. do you have questions, Shajun? Uh, what I want to ask is already crude these questions, I think. Okay. Okay, very good, very nice. Um, so let me move to the second part of my talk. And uh, the second part of my talk uh, will be on enhancing the performance of the waveguide that I showed you, and then, then looking into some new devices such as a coupled waveguide and a cavity, then being able to use that as a modulator and a sensor and a demultiplexer. And we'll talk about those, those array of devices in next few minutes. Now, one of the challenges that, that we had early on was how to enhance the bandwidth of these waveguides. Now, we did, we did some, uh, geometrical, um, some geometrical uh, optimizations and improved the bandwidth to up to uh, 35, 30 to 35 gigahertz. 
and then used uh, uh, quadrature amplitude modulation to send data at speeds of about 160 gigabits per second. This is, and this was just across two bands. Um, so if it works for two bands, it also works for 10 bands. Uh, of course, there'll be a little bit loss uh, on the order of about 0.1 dB per band. Um, but then after our initial demonstration, we just restricted our devices to about two bands as a proof of concept demonstration. And you can see that here, uh, we wanted to we wanted to uh, determine if, uh, for example, creating some defects in the form of free carriers along the path of the wave, does that smash the bandwidth of the device? As as you can see that the transmission drops, but the bandwidth pretty much stays the same as you as you pump one particular point on this waveguide. So this is basically the domain wall along which the transport of the photons is happening. And this data shows that on pumping, uh, you can actively tune the transmission levels, but it doesn't affect the, the linearity of the device, okay? so. It doesn't destroy the topological protection. We are still, uh, even, even after photo pumping, um, we, we can send same speed of data, uh, but uh, we, we just had to increase the, uh, increase the power levels of our source, okay? So there was no difference in the linearity of the device, linearity of our, um, of of our receivers while uh, pumping the pumping the the chip itself, the waveguide chip itself, and this is how the experimental configuration looks like. The detailed uh, experimental configurations that we use to do this uh, type of uh, communication measurements. So one thing to note is um, you need a high speed modulator to be able to uh, send data at these speeds, and it's an it's an IQ modulator, and we use a, a, a difference frequency where one of the frequencies are uh, a telecom band frequency is is modulated using an optical modulator, and then that drives the Tara source, which is the UTCPD, a uh, unit traveling carrier photodiode that generates the the CW terahertz, and that gets um, channeled through the waveguide on the transmitter side and on the detector side. On the detector side, it's a, uh, it's a heterodyne detection again, um, uh, using uh, some sort of, uh, we detect it using some sort of a down conversion. Um, and, and that's a, this is a typical Terra's communication uh, test bed. So I was talking to you about the linearity of the device. This is the linearity that I was telling you that relative power of the transmitter side, if you can increase, then the device performance uh, doesn't change. It's this part upon pumping or, or generating some free carriers out of silicon that acts as obstruction to the photons doesn't change the linearity of the device. So this is without pump and this is with, with pump, okay? Just that you have to enhance the source power here, okay? So these are results that we are very proud of. And uh, this is the, 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 the vector map, the data map that, that shows up um, for the 160 Gbps performance for the device. And this is the reference, which means without the chip, just a, just a transmitter and a detector being there. This is the performance. You see that the reference signal is more cleaner than the signal that you get from the, from the device itself. So 
we use quam 32 um, modulation and uh, so so quam 32 and about uh, 40, uh, 32 gigabaud um, as as the symbol rate and that is what can give you 160 gigabit per second yeah now uh, from this single channel topological chip we go to a uh, uh, topological waveguide plus cavity type of a configuration where the cavity itself in combination with waveguide can act as a demultiplexer now what exactly is a demultiplexer so you could send two different frequencies carrier frequencies modulated at different rates at the input end and here in the coupling region because this waveguide a topological waveguide is coupled to this cavity and this is a topological cavity you can see that the main wall is formed by uh, by one color of the unit cells inside there's one color outside there's another color which means there's a boundary and it is this boundary that supports the topological transport of light now if you design your device in such a way that they remain coupled then when a when a signal is channeled through the input and this cavity will pick the frequency that matches with its resonant frequency with its fundamental resonant frequency and that frequency will uh, will circulate here and and it could be coupled out from this end so there'll be one frequency that goes straight which in this case is the is the second carrier fc2 whereas the first carrier which is a uh, which is carrying a, a narrow band signal can be channeled through the to the other output end right so at this input end you have two carriers but at the output end, you have individual outputs, one from this output and the second one from this output. We call this as channel one. This one is the channel two. So the separation of these two carrier signal by the device itself, because they are coupled, uh, is known as the multiplexing operation here on the chip. Okay, so note that the waveguide, the signal that goes through the waveguide um, can support higher bitrate because waveguide is still broadband, whereas cavity is narrowband. So the signal that you send through the cavity at its resonance frequency is a narrowband signal, okay? So, so through this port, we, we can send data at rates of 40 gigabits per second, and through this port, we send data at about one and a half gigabits per second. Okay. So here is the, the, the detailed configuration. This is actually an image of our silicon chip itself. Uh, and uh, when we measured the resonance feature, so you can see in the simulation that uh, this is the the, the transport of light along the boundaries, along the edges. And when you measure the transmission, you see the, the two resonances. This is the fundamental, and, and this is the, the next order mode. Uh, the FSR, the free spectral range between these two resonances is about 4.2 gigahertz. The Q factor of this cavity is about, um, about 200,000. Uh, we've so this this was our non-optimized non-optimized design. The Q factor that you see is a record Q factor uh, across any other platform, any no, non-topological platform uh, using a, a using a silicon chip or any other material. Uh, mainly at the teras frequency. So I can claim that this Q factor is the highest Q factor measured till date at teras frequency and on a chip, 
okay? But even in off-chip configuration, I'm not aware of a cavity that can have Q factor of above 200,000. Okay, if, if anybody is aware of any other work, then please bring it to my notice. Now, our most recent devices could have Q factor of about 25 million. Now, this is something still at the design stage. We've not tested our devices, but our goal is to design a topological cavity that could go up to a Q factor of about a billion or maybe even higher. At this point, we don't know how we'll do that, but, but that's our near-term goal. Um, now, once you have such a high cavity, you could do a lot of stuff, uh, not just demultiplexing, but, uh, but extremely low energy modulation, uh, extremely sensitive sensors and on-chip spectrometer, um, and and the list can and the list can go on. I mean, such a cavity would also be useful for lasing, Terra's lasing application. So, uh, just to show you that there's a domain wall feature associated with transport that happens at all the edge. You see that the wave comes in here, and the wave is propagating in the forward direction. The the momentum matching condition has to be satisfied for this wave to couple from the waveguide to the cavity. And you see on the top, on the top edge of the cavity, the wave is traveling in the opposite direction. Uh, so it's traveling in the backward direction. And again, here at the bottom edge, it, it travels in the forward direction. So just to show that this is really a cavity that is formed by the by the domain walls and, and we stumbled on uh, something that took us some time for, understand, for us to understand. And that was, so, so without, without pumping, so by pumping, but by pump power, what we mean is that we just excite free carriers on a single unit cell of the domain wall uh, that is part of the edge of the cavity. So on a single unit cell. So when we started to pump, actually the idea was to quench the cavity resonance. But you see here, that without any pump, the zero milliwatt data is, a, is not a very deep resonance, right? It's not a deep resonance, but when we started to um, we saw that it initially showed a strengthening of the resonance. So, in 0.55 milliwatt, we have the deepest resonance and the sharpest resonance. And then beyond that, as you pump, the resonance starts to quench, right? So, it took us some time to understand that what exactly is going on here. But then, after some, some thought, and, and, and some discussions, we figured out that when we are pumping the system, actually we are driving the system from an overcoupled regime to a critically coupled regime. So this point at which we get the sharpest resonance is the critical coupling point that gives the minimum transmission at the resonance point. So, so the condition for critical coupling is really that the coupling rate becomes equal to the damping rate of this cavity, okay? And that will give you a very sharp and deep resonance. Uh, and once you sit at the critical coupling, um, your, the entire system acts as a very sensitive, uh, very sensitive modulator. You can switch off the resonance at extremely small power, uh, pump power, um, that for which we use a green laser, okay? So we use a five, uh, 532 nanometer uh, CW laser to pump the domain ball, okay? So here is, is, the, is the critical coupling condition that I said, once the intrinsic decay rate of the cavity matches the coupling rate from the waveguide, you hit you hit this critical coupling mm -hmm. condition, 
where the transmission amplitude, I mean, the, the peak, peak amplitude is, is maximum. Um, if you are just looking at the, at the minimum trans, I mean, the minimum transmission point, uh, it, it, it goes to the, to the minimum transmission at a particular frequency at the critical coupling point. But here, uh, I'm talking about the transmission amplitude, which means I'm talking about this, this amplitude from, from this point to this point. So you can see that the amplitude is maximum uh, at the, for the critical coupling point because, because it's the deepest here, right? Um, and the other regions are the overcoupled region and the undercoupled region. So using an optical external pump, you can drive the system from overcoupled to critically coupled to undercoupled uh, regime, which is a, a very fascinating thing. So you are dynamically pushing the system from overcoupled to critically coupled to undercoupled regime. I mean, we've not come across any system where um, such experiments were done. And, and being able to do this with a topological platform was, uh, was fun. And, and like here, again, you see the, the, the transmission amplitude. Um, as I said, you go from overcoupled to critically coupled to undercoupled regime here. So, and here what you're sweeping, what you're changing is just the pump power, like a tuning knob. So this is where, this is how the green laser, it was shining on a single unit cell. And that itself can drive the system from overcoupled to critically coupled to an undercoupled regime. And uh, we use this, we use this property to cause modulation and did uh, 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 a very nice modulation experiment using the chopper. So uh, the change in transmission amplitude we defined as T pump minus T no pump. And, and that modulation uh, again was done by uh, using a chopper and the green laser. So the best modulation rates that we uh, got was about uh, 10 kilohertz here. But we were limited in, in our case just by the chopper. If we could get a better modulator, we could drive the number beyond 10 kilohertz. And from the material perspective, just by using ion implantation at these domain wall or maybe just on one particular unit cell, we can drive the modulation speeds all the way up to gigahertz. Speed. So using such high Q cavities, at some point, we should be able to design uh, uh, a few tens of gigahertz um, modulator, few gig um, gigahertz modulator uh, for the terahertz radiation, okay? Now, we thought what else could be done using this cavity. So, so we did a very simple sensing experiment where we brought in um, a polyimide, a 25 micron thin polyimide, uh, which is which is a plastic-like material close to the cavity plane. So this is the, the topological cavity or the chip. And we this is like a bent, a bent uh, polyimide. And we bring it close to the chip. And since there's light circulating on the cavity here, and that light will have an evanescent extent, as you can see here. When the polyimide comes close and gets observed by these evanescent fields, then we start to see shift in the resonance, right? So you can see here that just by varying the distance of the polyimide analyte from the cavity, we change the critical coupling condition, right? So as you come from as you come from uh, 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 one particular distance to another distance, you can see that the resonance gets enhanced. So 
this is the the most enhanced resonance is the critically coupled um, uh, resonance at about 60 micron separation. And then as you uh, as you vary the distance, you go to a um, to an overcoupled regime where the resonance broadens and the amplitude itself get gets quenched. So there's two signature here, the shift itself and the quenching of the resonance. So there's change in amplitude and the change in frequency of the topological cavity. So this serves as a, as a dual metric, uh, 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 spectral metric and an amplitude, change in amplitude metric. Now we also did experiments with different thickness of the polyamide that was touching that was kept on top of the cavity. So you can see that with the different thickness of polyamide, we get different shifts. Uh, and for 50 micron thick, uh, you get, uh, you know, the resonance is almost quenched. So we start with uh, about six micron and go all the way up to uh, up to 50 micron. And we see a gradual shift in the frequency and a quenching in the amplitude. So somehow this serves as a as a dual metric. Now the figure of merit that we estimated for such high Q topological sensors is about four thousand. Um, this is a paper that we published very recently. So people who are interested in knowing more details should go and read the paper. It's, this this was published as a cover page article in APL about a month back. Now in terms of figure of merit, we we've got a record figure of merit, uh, which is basically uh, a, a ratio of the sensitivity uh, and the uh, uh, full width half maxima of the high Q resonance, which is basically the line width of the resonance. Uh, now, now, we've talked about the, the cavity Q factor. Uh, we talked about in the introduction, we talked about the demultiplexing type of uh, an application also, but I did not show you uh, a real performance, a demultiplexing performance of the device. I showed you also uh, an example of how a sensor works with this high Q cavity. Looks like this could act as a highly sensitive or high figure of merit sensor. Now, with respect to a demultiplexer, like I said uh, earlier, that you could send in two differently modulated carrier signal from the input and, and the device would automatically do a selection here where a narrowband signal that coincides with the resonance frequency of the cavity will get selected and the signal will, uh, will, be, will be located here and you could couple it out to channel one at this point. Since this is a cavity, it will be a narrow band signal. Uh, and since this is a waveguide, this will be a broadband signal. So it supports data rates of 40 gigabits per second. And here for the cavity, we send a video data uh, through this cavity at rates of one and a half gigabits per second. Okay. Um, so this is how the spectrum looks like. I mean, this is a screen that, uh, I mean, uh, a scheme that I already showed you. Uh, what I will show you next is that we could uh, shine green light on the waveguide and block this channel. So if even if we block the channel two, the channel one doesn't get affected. Okay. So when we totally smash this channel, there's no impact on this channel, okay? And then vice versa. When we shine light and create free carriers here, then the information of this channel is lost, but nothing happens to the information that gets transmitted through this channel. And that's what I'll show you in the next few slides. Now here is how the spectra looks like, the transmission spectra. Uh, so, the S21 is for channel two, which is pretty much a, 
a, a broadband uh, output, and S31 is the output from uh, from channel one. And this channel you can see has a lot of resonance features, right? So the FC1 frequency um, that sends the video data at one and a half gigabits per second is encoded at about 30 gigahertz. And, the, uh, and this is the cavity, but the other channel, the channel two, is the waveguide channel. So the waveguide channel you can see is broad. Okay, look at the blue line for the waveguide channel. So this bandwidth is used to send 40 gigabits per second of data rate. But for the cavity, it's a narrow bandwidth, right? So either you look at the, um, at the blue dip, that's the frequency that will be missing from this channel and gets coupled into the waveguide, or you look at this peak, the orange or the red peak, um, that that is a signature of information, narrowband information circulating in the cavity itself. Okay. So um, let me show you a video. So here you will see uh, that. Uh, so this is the this is the chip. It's a little bit difficult to see the chip. Uh, now, oh, sorry, yeah, this is the chip, and here is the input, okay? So here we do a channel one plus channel two input, and you will see that the signal will either uh, go here, so this acts like uh, channel two, and this will act as channel one. So this particular arm uh, will take the, the video data, on the cavity. Now, the, the output from the cavity goes to a mirror here. There's a very small mirror here, which is in the background. I don't think you can see it very clearly, but what that mirror does it, it, it reflects the signal into this horn antenna. So you can see that this horn antenna is kept orthogonal to the chip, but since there's a mirror here, that reflects the signal into this horn antenna. But remember that this is the uh, this is the channel one that is carrying the video data wirelessly, and this is the wireless link here, right here. Whereas here in channel two, a wired data goes in, a high-speed data of 40 gigabits per second goes in, okay? So this is channel one, this is channel two. Here you simultaneously couple um, the two frequencies differently modulated frequencies. Now, when I show you this video, what you'll see is um, you can bring in a, a paper, with a paper with a metallic coating. And when you bring that paper with metallic coating here, it will block the video completely because whatever video you will see is the data that is being coupled into this horn antenna, which represents the channel one. So let me play this video. So this is the chip. This is the channel one plus two. This is channel one. Uh, this is the channel two. And you bring in a paper with metal on top and it will block the entire video. Yeah, so the entire video is gone. But you see that the, the output of channel two is intact. This is the output of so the output of channel two can still be seen. So channel two is this one, right? So this is a simple paper, no metal, and nothing happens. So you have both signals. The channel two signal here, the 40 gigabits per second, and this video is, uh, is the channel one signal. So I, I hope this is clear. Maybe I should play this video again for you. Um, so, so please note that when you block the channel one, channel two is not blocked, okay? The data through channel two propagates, and this screen shows the channel two data 
which is 40 gigabits per second. But when you block this part, so the video data on, on the top half disappears. Let me play this again. It will block the video signal, but not the signal on channel two. When you take it back, you have the video signal as well as the channel two signal. Again, it's blocked. And now with a simple paper, no metal here, nothing happens. You have both the data, the top as well as the bottom data, okay? So th this was just to show you how nicely this multiplexer wo uh, works. So in the previous case, we were sort of blocking the blocking the signal from the uh, we were blocking the video signal and was showing you that the data from the waveguide was intact. But here, what we will do is we will block the waveguide signal and we'll show you that the video remains intact. So when you shine pump light here on the chip, so this is again the, the setup configuration. So when you shine um, green laser here, the entire 40 gigabits per second data gets smashed. There's no, you can't see the constellation, but the video data is visible, which means you crunch the data here, but the data around the cavity doesn't get affected. So you can independently smash one of the channels, but the other channel just works, just works fine, okay? So the isolation between the waveguide and the cavity is nearly perfect. Uh, let me show you uh, another video here where you can uh, see that as we, uh, smash the waveguide, the video doesn't, doesn't disappear. The video remains the same. And if the video is on, it means that the information being carried by the cavity is not getting affected. So let me play this video. So now the light will turn on. You can see that 40 gigabits per second data has disappeared, but nothing has happened to the video the video is still visible. So you switch off the light and the 40 gigabits per second of data reappears. So when the video and the 40 gbps data appears, that means there's no pump. And pump, when the pump is on, smashing this pump data, the video is not affected, okay? So these are uh, some of the, uh, you know, some of the, functionalities that we showed uh, a, a demultiplexer, a simple waveguide and a sensor. Now, uh, the question is, where do we go from here? What, what are our future plans? Now, as I said, our plan is to integrate a resonant only diode on top of a chip. We are designing all kinds of splitters. Uh, these are power, power splitters. So we've been able to design 50-50 splitter and also asymmetric um, power splitting using uh, these topological concepts with nearly no loss um, at these bends. So you can see that if a chip can afford to have bends, then you can have a denser integration. We are also working on uh, high-speed electrical modulators based on these ultra-high Q topological cavities uh, we are designing slow light devices through, uh, through some dispersion engineering that we could do just by playing with the interfacial domain walls and, and then uh, just by controlling the topological state, we can control the, the group velocity of the photons that get guided on this chip. We are also designing some filters, um, narrow band filters, uh, notch filters based on, on, on this concept. Uh, and uh, another 
uh, sort of goal that we have is to, to use quantum materials to interact with this cavity, uh, not only to, to quench the uh, to quench the cavity resonance and do high speed modulation, but all to, also to see what we could observe in terms of cavity induced new physics in the quantum material itself. For example, a polaritonic type of system. Um, so this is like a, a, a future vision slide uh, where as to where uh, my group is going with respect to the design of, of topological devices and components at the Terra's domain. Um, this is a, a, a picture of a beam farmer that is uh, that is built on the idea of um, topological interfaces, topological waveguides. So you come in with one waveguide and you split the signal into 16 parts. It's a one by 16 splitter. And if we can manipulate the phase between the each coupler, we'll be able to, um, to, to radiate the signal in very specific directions such that the energy is focused at definite angles. So right now we have, we've designed devices and have already carried out experiments where beam farming was, uh, was, was possible. And this type of beam farming scheme is also very important for communication application. Um, so this is one of the very impressive pictures of, of our devices. Um, and this is a beam farming topological waveguide device through which we will also send some data and will do high speed uh, communication. Uh, using this type of uh, beam farming. Overall, the vision is that um, the CMOS electronics and silicon photonics, especially for terahertz, has to come together, and maybe it will come together in the form of some 3D architecture of a chip where you will have all the electronics in different planes, and there will be one plane um, probably devoted to photonics uh, and, and these uh, 3D architectures could be possible through heterogeneous integration, uh, hopefully in, in, in near future uh, to make a uh, 6G trans receiver possible where terahertz will have a very big role to play. Um, uh, however, there has to be um, there has to be some fundamental aspects that must be addressed from the electronic side uh, as well as uh, in the photonic side. So I think there's a lot of activity going on uh, in terms of designing sources, power amplifiers on the electronic side, um, and and overall all the concepts of electronics and photonics has to come together to minimize the loss in the terahertz band uh, to make terahertz massive multiple input, multiple output communication at terabit per second possible. So these are potential areas that a lot of research is going on and some of it um, we are also involved in and, and is a, a, a good future directions to look into uh, to make terabit per second uh, wireless communication possible. Now, I come to a point where, uh, from where I started my talk, that finally um, massive digital training uh, of the physical and the biological world will be possible only through 6G communications 5G will achieve a lot of goals, but I think 6G comes, comes with many, many new revolutionary use cases um, and, and will be an ideal intersection of the dig digital, physical, and the biological world. And like I said, will be the ultimate uh, network with a sixth sense embedded in the network itself where the network will be able to see the environment, 
detect as to what's there in the environment and would uh, augment human humans in a way that the human productivity will be enhanced. So there's a lot of activity globally. These are some major projects that's going on in the US and Europe and uh, a lot also in, um, in Asia, specifically in China, Japan, Korea, and, and some in Singapore. So I'm, my, me and my group, we are working with these industrial players to develop some of the concepts and, and to translate some of our proof of concept ideas into commercial devices. We'll have to see uh, how successful we would be, but uh, beyond 5G and 6G market, by 2035 will be a huge market. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of opportunity for young people, for young students, as well as researchers to explore in this particular area. And, and through my talk, I would like to inspire and encourage more people to, to work in this area and come up with new revolutionary terrace devices um, in the form of new sources, detectors, manipulators, beam farmers. Um, yeah, that would be compatible with electronics and with photonics. So thank you very much. That's all I had to say uh, in, in my tutorial today. I would be happy to take uh, questions for next 10, 15 minutes or whatever yeah. time remains. Thank you very much. Yeah, the second part is also very, very interesting and very impressive. Actually you, here, sure. I have one question. Yeah, I, I will go first by my question that, um, you in your in your first device and in your second device in your third device you mm -hmm. use the optical pumping to uh, optical injection some careers in your silicon material yeah it's just uh excitation of photo carriers uh Shiajin. you just take a silicon wafer and shine yeah. light on it yeah but yeah. Uh, as far as we know the there will be a lot of careers optically yes. injected into your yes. device. And, uh, but yes. the result is that your topological waveguide, your topological devices do not sense, I mean, do not be interrupted by this, right? Yes, yes. So if your fluence, as you can see here, if your fluence is extremely small, then it so, so we shine light in a very tightly focused way uh, just on one unit cell so here we are exciting carriers on a very very small area okay? okay and we do this experiment very carefully so these power levels are very um, small okay so if, if you increase the pump power what will yeah, happen so, Every you will lose all the resonance features and you'll lose all the transmission. Yeah. So carriers are just like spoilers here. Yes. And uh, my question is that if you use a strong field of terahertz to pump it, what will happen? Yeah. So that that is a uh, uh, that is an open question. If you want to do that experiment, we'll be happy to send you some samples. Okay. Yeah, I think- But wait, wait I, we send you a postdoc to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> but-, but yeah, yeah. yeah, yes, but developing the facility will take time, Shajun. But yeah, we have I these see. samples, we can just send you these samples. But we don't have the test system there. Oh, right, right. You don't have the CW system, yeah, yes. Because we, yeah, we have, uh, but yes. we have to combine several labs together. Okay. Yes. Yeah, let, let's talk about that later. And the second mm -hmm. question from me is that since, you know, people have already used the topological insulator for high harmonic generation for some nonlinear terahertz yes. optics. Exactly. So my question is that since your device right now is all, uh, all the linear, working in the linear low weak field yes. of the terahertz. And yes. uh, do we have the chances to design some 
nonlinear terrorist optics? Yes, yes. So I, I think this cavity platform uh, is ideal to look at some uh, nonlinearity in uh, in material systems. So uh, if we could integrate um, if we could integrate some interesting material. Uh, on this uh, domain wall of the topological cavity, then we should see some uh, some enhanced nonlinearity. But if you are asking me about nonlinearity of silicon itself, then that's that's something that we've not observed in our experiments uh, so far. Uh, but then um, it it would also depend on how we are probing how we are probing that that particular nonlinearity that we are looking for. Maybe yeah. there is a nonlinearity signature embedded in the resonance behavior, but we are not being able to extract it. Mm, yeah, my, my question is that since topological insulator can be used to generate high harmonic terahertz, yeah, Tanner mm, Cascope mm, 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 has mm. demonstrated that. Sure. Whether we don't care about the, the silicon material, but we care about the structure design so mm -hmm. that we can also just to, to rearrange these patterns mm -hmm. and then get the topological property and then stimulate some yeah. uh, harmonics like that. Sure, sure. So, so Shiajun, let me, let me clarify one thing. I think here we are getting confused with an actual topological insulator and uh, a so-called uh, fake topological insulator, right? So everything I told you today is like a classical fake topological insulator. Yes. Uh, which is which is only for for photons, right? Yeah. So every, everything is so for this type of topological um, photonic insulator. Uh, you only need a, a, a dielectric with high refractive index that uh, that can that is not so lossy for terahertz. Now, if you're talking about topological materials, you know the the electronic materials, for example, the, the topological insulators like bismuth selenides and tellurides and and uh, for example, also cadmium arsenide, that's another material that we are looking at. They have very high nonlinearity. And people are looking at terahertz generation using that nonlinearity. For example, in cadmium arsenide, people are looking at huge chi 2 nonlinearity. Uh, so I, I think that's what you are referring to. Hello. Shiajun, I, I cannot hear you. Uh, do we do we have uh, do we have other questions? Uh, maybe if other people who have questions can either type in the chat or uh... hi Ranjan. Hi, hi. Hi, this is Gu. Hi, hey, Gu. What's up, man? How are you? <laughs> Very impressive talk. Very impressive talk. Thank you. Um, thank you, so, Gu. You should ask questions. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. I have, uh, I have some questions. Uh, mm -hmm. I think, I think, uh, Xiao Jun, uh, maybe some uh, have some network problem. Uh, I, I cannot yeah. hear her also. Also, uh, the first one I want to ask is that uh, uh, how, how is the field confinement on the on your chip? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very good question. Go. Uh, so the field confinement is something that we are still trying to um, we are still trying to understand. But then when we did the sensing experiment, we got some idea of how much the confinement is let me let me show you that data yeah so that here so mm -hmm. here this this uh, this field extend uh, is about 200 micron uh 
away from the pain of the device. Away from, yes, yes, yes. So only two, 200 micron, yeah. Oh, 200 micron, okay, okay. Yes. That's really very tight. That's really very tight. Uh, yes, yes. So that is what helps us in uh, sensing the analyte. So if you see, we never mm -hmm. touch this. We never touch this on the chip. So there's all there's always a five micron separation. If mm -hmm. we touch this on the chip, then our signal is completely gone. Oh. Because the cavity is a very very high Q cavity. Yeah. So we sense evanescently. Mm -hmm. Okay. You you okay. see that as, as we bring the analyte closer, all these changes in the resonance happens. Yeah, yeah, I see, I see. So we come from far distance and we we come from far and then we move this gradually using mm -hmm. a, a controlled motor. Okay, okay, I see. So by so that that's very tight uh, uh, field confinement, and the second question is that uh, I think uh, the the first question of Xiaojun is is the same, uh, because we uh, I, I'm not quite uh, understand the, uh, I, I'm I, I'm not quite familiar with topological insulator, but uh, uh, I I heard that uh, topological insulator should be not sensitive to the uh, scattering um, caused yeah. by the fabrication uh, error or something drawback. But uh, yeah. you can use uh, carrier, uh, carrier uh, yeah. injection to modulate your device. But uh, in my opinion, uh, point carrier injection by optical pumping can be understood as a kind of scattering a region that uh, equals to some fabrication drawbacks. So so why? Yeah. So why your yeah. insulator is sensitive to optical pumping? Good question. Um, so 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 good, there are there are two aspects to to the question that you asked. Um, one aspect is that um, you know we should always separate the, the electronic defect and a defect for a photonic system, okay? So in a photonic okay. system, in a photonic mm -hmm. system, electronic defect logic doesn't apply. Uh, in mm -hmm. a photonic system, defect means the sharp bends. The sharp bend is the defect, okay? Okay. Like, Okay. So this bend and this bend of the cavity and this bend and this bend. So typically, mm -hmm. if you don't have topology, you cannot guide the light through the bends efficiently. Mm -hmm. okay? Because this is uh, this is actually a wave guide. So, so the bend in photonic system, the bends are equivalent to electronic defects in fermionic systems. Okay. So, so first, first, that should be very clear. And the second point that you highlighted uh, is is this. So, so here, at the end of the day, um, you have a very nice waveguide um, with nice confinement and all that. But if you put an obstruction on this waveguide, you will see a decrease in transmission. Okay? Uh, mm -hmm. So there is, yeah. there is no, there's no concept of the wave bending around and going. Bending around and going is only possible in fermionic systems and not for external defects. That they can do only for material defects. Okay, so, right. so you mean like the, the defect, uh, uh, the defect, uh, the, uh, the defect detonated in the electric topological insulator is not the same as uh, yes. the yes. topological insulator for optics. 
right? Yes. For objects, yes, exactly. The, 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 exactly. The, the narrow band is the defect. Yes, the char band is the defect here. Okay. 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 And I, and coming back to the second part of your question, even even though you see that the generation of the carriers it starts mm -hmm. to absorb some terahertz and the transmission goes down. Yes. But, but the bandwidth doesn't get affected. You see, the bandwidth almost remains the same. Oh, so, uh, so if, the, if the bandwidth remains the same, then our data speeds doesn't get affected, like how we, how we show in this particular slide. You okay. see the you see our data speed, the bit error rate of the with free carrier and without free carrier is is exactly the same. You just have to increase your source power. Okay. Okay. So we use this data to to show that our device is robust even to carrier injection to some extent. I see. Yeah. So, so this is true for the waveguide, but when you go to a cavity and a high Q cavity, high Q cavity is very, very sensitive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can yes. Quench, yes. quench the resonance with just a little bit of carrier injection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, the third question is about the coupling of your uh, topological insulator device. Uh, it's very interesting that using a, sh a, a needle-like, I think it is needle-like uh, silicon, yeah. silicon yeah. Or, or metallic rod. No, this is silicon. This is silicon, okay. yeah. Uh, and you say that the coupling efficiency can reach to nearly 100%, right? 99%, yes. 99%. It's really very high. Very high. Because uh, I'm not quite sure, uh, but in, 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 in Tianjin University, you know, there are some students, not mine, but uh, there are some students of other uh, researchers that they're also working on the topological insulator based on silicon. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, their coupling efficiency is very low, especially for, um, for, for, for if, especially when you use a, photo, uh, photo, a PCA, photoconductive antenna at the emitter. Mm. And that, that's the very, that's the very, uh, point to that why we cannot use our uh, near field in, uh, system to scan the field along the uh, topological insulator device because we have a low coupling efficiency and the, 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 the field along the uh, device is lower than the noise level sure but sure. but your but your coupling method is quite good the coupling efficiency is quite good. Uh, I'm not quite sure what is the mode of your uh, topological insulator. It's it's the TE01 mode. Oh, TE01 mode. Yes. Oh, I see. And everything is wave guided. Everything is guided very nicely. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So I also uh, saw the last several slides of your uh, in, in your PPT is that uh, you want to use a multiplexer to do the uh, beam forming or beam uh, tracking, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in that uh, in that plan, uh, in that plan, mm, mm, if I am not uh, misunderstanding that you are trying to, yeah, not the, the last slide, yeah, you are trying to use uh, 16 uh, inputs yeah. Yeah. and to, to, to control the one output, the, the yes. direction of the one part. So the silicon rod is used as an antenna, right? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. That's a very good point. That's a very good idea. That's a very yeah. good idea. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay, that's all my question. <laughs> you can ask more. Try? Go. Can you hear me okay, now? Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, can yeah. hear you now. <laughs> okay, fine. Clearly, clearly. <laughs> okay. I don't know what has happened for my micro. Yeah. I see. For my microphone. Right now it works. Are there mm -hmm. any other questions? There is no more questions from my side and from the online platform. And I have no idea whether there are some questions from the oh, Q&A oh, box. Oh, yeah. oh. Hey, hey Long Ching, what's up? How are you? <laughs> Hi, I'm good. Mm, so, very uh, nice. Uh, can you uh, professor some questions so regarding the tower? Is there any uh I mean optimized uh, geometry for the big bike? The potential big bike for for life? Uh, the, uh, what exactly it is? I couldn't hear properly, Longqing. Uh, so um, it's a, it's about power, power distribution. Uh, no, no. So what I mean is the the uh, uh, optimized geometry for the for the uh, silicon base side uh, for the power bar. I mean power with yeah. the antenna, the bar. Yes. Is that a, a, a gradual uh, needle or something? Yes. 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 So. This, this tapering this part this tapering part is very important so uh, this part has to be designed very carefully the thickness and the dimensions of this coupler is very important uh okay so as before i didn't see the i mean uh, a, a, an accurate uh, description for this coupler in your paper so uh, it, uh so you mean it should be uh, designed very accurately, right, for the for the size? Uh, yeah, Longchen. If you need the exact designs, just write to us. We will give you. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Good. Thanks, thanks, for friend. Yeah. 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 Okay. I have no more questions. Yeah, I understand. I'll see you back. Uh, Thank you. Oh, what's wrong? Okay. Okay. Now I can hear you. Can't hear me again. Yeah. Now I can hear you. Okay. Oh, yeah. just now I have Very raised clear. your large, and I see no, there is no failure in your face. <laughs> your face. Okay. <laughs> I will see it again. So okay. we'd like to thank Professor Ranger again and to give us okay. a wonderful and impressive talk. And I am pretty sure that uh, most of the audience today have read Professor Ranger's work about the metal surfaces and uh, the topological terahertz photonics is a little bit new for me at least, but it's a very, uh, you have already said it's a very powerful platform for to development the terahertz devices and very useful for the next uh, generation wireless communications. So, I mean, hopefully in the near future, first is that we meet offline and uh, yeah, we and chat more and uh, sure. hopefully everything come back to normal. Sure, second sure, is sure. that, yeah, the second is that, and if you have, an, I mean, the audience have some other questions and we can, you can contact us in the email to Professor Ranji and uh, to start some collaborations. And yeah, the third sure. one is that I need to advertisement that tomorrow morning we will have our uh, fourth Terahertz open uh, photonics open course at half past nine. So that's all for today's tutorial. Thank you. Thank, <laughs> thank you very much. So right now I see some smile on your face, and just now I see it a lot, but no feeling there. I see. Okay. Thank you so, so much. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. Thank you. See you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah. Take care. Bye -bye. Take care. Yeah. Bye bye. You too. Bye bye.